Stay hungry, stay foolish. Today's episode is an intimate and inspirational exploration of Stephen Hawking, a man that touched the lives of millions. It is also a story of friendship written by his friend and physicist and renowned author of multiple titles including Subliminal, Elastic, Euclid's Window, Feynman's Rainbow, The, Up the Upright Thinkers, The War of Worldviews with Deepak Chopra and two books co-authored with Stephen Hawking himself. This book today is Stephen Hawking, a memoir of friendship and physics. And our guest today is the brilliant author, Leonard Mladenov. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Before we even start today, I want to pass on my sympathies. I know you lost your mother during this pandemic and she was a fighter. She was a Holocaust survivor. And I just wanted to honor her. And perhaps you wanted to say a word, word on that relationship because I know she had a, a huge impact on your life. Well, thanks, Aiden. Um, yeah, she had a huge, you know, what can I say? She was a, a, a great mother and inspiration. She always made me feel that I could uh, do whatever I set my mind to and gave me the confidence to uh, approach the world that way and to be resilient and take the knocks and, uh, and not get uh, a big head when I had successes and, and just to move forward uh, following my passions and knowing that I could... Um, you know, making me feel that I could accomplish anything. So she was a, a survivor, uh, as was my dad, Holocaust survivors. And I think the people who got through it had to have that kind of, uh, that kind of resilience. Um, not that she didn't have her quirks, which I write about it in, in, uh, in great detail, but yes, thank you. And I, I really miss her. Well, it's great, man. And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So she, you've, she's passed on and, and your father, great traits to you. But let's let's get into this book, because this is a tribute that you've written to both your friendship with Stephen Hawking, but also to the man himself. And I thought I'd start with a little passage that I took from the book. So it goes as follows. Stephen was world famous for stirring up the physics word world for writing about it, and for doing all that that from within a broken body but just as challenging to someone who cannot move, and especially to someone who cannot speak, is to maintain long-term friendships, to develop deep relationships, and to find love. Stephen knew that it was human bonds, love, and not just his physics that nourished him, and in that too, he had succeeded beyond reasonable expectation. I thought we'd use that as a way to set context for how you and Stephen developed this remarkable friendship. Well, um, you know, that, that's really true. Pe people, uh, when they think about him, they, you know, they think about his work. Uh, they think of him as a great physicist and what he had to overcome to, uh, to survive and to, and to, you know, to do the kind of work that, um, it, that it seems impossible to do all in your head without a blackboard or w without really being able to um, easily read other papers or talk at length with other people. Um, but of course, uh, I think I think in his life, what's what's more important in all of our lives is not just our work; it's, it's our personal relationships. And he had the same challenges in his personal relationships that he had in, in doing his physics. So, you, um, you know, how do you bond with people? It's through uh, talking to them, through spending time with them, uh, going through things with them. And uh, Stephen's difficulties in in communicating applied, of course, to, to his personal relationships, to having casual or deep conversations with people. His conversations have to be really somewhat focused and, um, you know, uh, cut short. And, and so I think that would, for, for most people would, would be a great barrier to forming bonds, and yet he, he was able to do it. And I talk in the book about some of the, some of the ways he did that, which was to transcend it, the, the need for uh, in many ways to transcend the need for verbal communication altogether and to be so expressive with his face and with his expressions and with his eyes and, and he would he would develop a kind of a shorthand where you would almost I picture it like aliens communicating telepathically uh, 
and and you get you 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 learn how to how to when you do address him how to talk in ways that he can easily answer or to ask yes or no questions or but also to react and check in with him verbally with what you see he he seemed to be seeing on his face and to so make sure you're on the same wavelength and it was quite an effective way of communicating and some of his best friends said to me that they thought that uh, the words for him were in a way more like the the spice but the meat was the the eye contact and the facial uh, communication and and getting to know him and and getting into to feel what, what he feels. Yeah, and you obviously learned this very quickly to have co-authored two books with him and actually to su simplify some of his previous work as well, which is remarkable. But I thought we'd share with our audience some of uh, parts of his life that we were unfamiliar with, for example, rowing in Cambridge, he rowed in Cambridge, he, you know, not very well, as you say in the book, but he did. And you know, he's married his children, all those type of things that people were unaware of, because as you say, we know Stephen Hawking, the celebrity in a way, but we don't know the backstory. And you got to know that very intimately. But I thought we'd start with how you met and how you ended up actually landing in Cambridge and writing this book. Well, he, he contacted me. He read my first uh, my first two books, Euclid's Window, which was about um, curved space, the idea of curved space and how it developed through history, starting from the Greeks and what it means and how it's used in physics. And, and then I wrote a book, a memoir, just like the one I've written now about Stephen, a memoir about um, my relationship with Richard Feynman, who was an iconic physicist uh, who died in the late 80s. And that's when I was first starting my career. And he had a great influence on me. And so Stephen, at that time in the early 2000s, was looking for somebody to work with because it is so difficult for him to communicate and to write uh, that he, he wanted uh, a co-author. And for the first book, he wasn't so much looking for someone to share uh, the development of the book as someone to work with him to help him uh, take his big, famous book, A Brief History of Time, and rewrite it in a, in a, in a way that's clearer. And uh, he's very picky, and I, he, I guess he had been looking for a while, and I, I feel honored that he picked me, but he wanted someone who understood physics, but also... He th whose writing he liked and who, he, and who he thought had a good sense of humor. And I guess that after reading those two books, he, he settled on me. I, he'd been looking for a while. And, and we wrote that. It's called, it became a book called A Briefer History of Time. So we took that book and, and we just revised it. It's, it's really um, more of a, uh, a re-edit or a remake in some ways of the original book, just meant to be clear or keep the same spirit and m m most of the same words. But... Yeah, we cut things that were complicated. We elaborated where it was um, important, made things clearer. So that was a very relatively easy and a great experience. Uh, and so we did that together. But when it was over, I, I had this idea that we should do something much more ambitious. I had gotten to know him just a little bit because uh, so I was at Caltech at the time and he was, of course, at Cambridge and he would come to Caltech for about a month or a few weeks every year. So we would meet then and we would email each other. But it was uh, it was fairly. I didn't have to go there for that book. It was fairly easy to um, to rework that book. And then I had this idea. I was reading his papers in the early two thousands that were really uh, fascinating to me, and I thought, you know, his previous books, Brief History of Time, Universe in a Nutshell, uh, Briefer History of Time. Those are all about his work in the seventies uh, and an early eighties, and he's done a lot since then, and, and especially his work in the early two thousands. I thought was really exciting and interesting. And I thought, wow, we should, you know, we should write a book on that. And so the next time he came to Caltech, I went to his office to say hi. I, I thought I'd ask him, propose this idea, and maybe he'd think about it for a while. And, and he, you know, I'm thinking, well, he probably won't want to do that, but, but maybe I can convince him. But he just jumped at it. He immediately said, yeah, that's a great idea. And that was it. It took us about a year to work out the, uh, the outline and, another four years to write the book. And this was a totally original book starting from scratch on new material. And so it was, you know, 10 times <laughs> harder than, than the original book. And it, that's what, but that's where we really bonded because then it's where I had to start shuttling uh, to and from Cambridge. And, and we had to really work intensely together to, uh, to, to write the book. He is not, even though he, he has, 
had great difficulties communicating, he didn't let that stop him from being <laughs> picky and a perfectionist. So uh, we, at times, we would go. I mean, we would go over every every bit. You know, so the way we, we way it worked was he wrote. So after we got our outline together, he wrote some parts. I wrote other parts, and then we would trade them. Then we would meet and discuss each other's work. And every word he would look at every word. And I, I, I thought it was funny that he's the one who had to work so hard. He was that communicating it would come out about six words a minute. He'd have to, at first he used his thumb, he could move his thumb and later uh, that wouldn't work. So he would twitch his cheek and he had a sensor that would read that and it would translate to a click. And one way or another, he would use that to pick words on the computer screen, which we can talk about later if you want. But it was very <laughs> tedious for him. And it's about six words a minute. And yet at the end, it would be me who, who always gave up um, an argument because I got worn down. Not, never him. He, he had infinite patience to just keep pecking away and, and saying what he wanted to say. And so we, anyway, we worked together very closely uh, to get that done. And uh, so the, I think what you were, the, the first time we met, we met, I mean, the first time we met in his office, the first time I went to Cambridge, uh, I remember I was still nervous because I had, I had met him here and we'd worked together on the other book, but there hadn't been really any any heavy lifting to do. And I didn't even have to go and see him in his environment. And now here I was going to the great Stephen Hawking's building, his office, with all his people there. And, I'm, and he put aside a whole week or two just to work with me on this uh, intensely. And so I'm going to, you know, see what his life is like, you know, go into his cave and I, I was nervous and I, I, I saw him and um, so I didn't wasn't uh, quite sure well first when I got there he was on the cow on the couch which I didn't know what that meant at the time but I had to wait outside while his door was closed and he, it was basically when his carers helped him relieve himself on his couch and then so I waited about 10 minutes and then they opened the door I walk in I, I say some stupid silly words i'm so glad to be here or you know how exciting this is and then he looks at me he starts typing away and i think oh wow what's he gonna say and then the word comes out banana <laughs> and he was just he, he's like forget you it's time for my banana he had mashed banana and kiwi several times a day and it was time after his uh what he had done he wanted his banana and uh, his carer jumps up and starts getting it ready for him. And I'm thinking, I just flew 6,000 miles to, to hear this and be totally ignored. But then he, he looked, he turned his eyes at me, and then he, he welcomed me, and we started working. But that's the way it was with him. It, 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 would, um, it's, it was like an oracle speaking to you sometimes. It reminded me of like, because you talked about the, the awkward silence that ensued, then you're like, honey, what's he going to say? And then the banana, banana comes out. But then I was like, going, how wise of him to get his blood sugar level well, first, first before, before he engages with you. But one of the things you talked about the like the sheer endeavor here by both of you and on your side of the bridge here as well. But for Stephen to to communicate was such an obstacle. But you he never you tell us he never felt a victim. In the early days, he did, and he went through some depression, etc. But he, but he really had massive resilience because he wasn't given long to live. But I, I'll come back to that, Leonard. But I wanted to share the first time, the, and this is just to show the the challenges that you guys had when he he had sweat on his brow, and you wanted to dab it to get rid of it, and you were kind of gaining in confidence in a way, but then you were kind of given a little slap on the wrist by the universe. Well, so his, his cure popped out to, to go to the loo, and normally somebody would come in uh, and watch, but, but this was going to be really quick, and she was starting to get comfortable with me being there, but it was toward the beginning. Um, and, and so I'm watching him, and I'm thinking, I see a bead of sweat on his brow starting to, like, inch its way down very gradually and I'm going oh that you know it, 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 it was really it was really hot I have to say in his office too a lot of the time no air conditioning and uh, you know that that kind of thing really bugs you and you just wash it away but, but just staring at it made, made me feel I couldn't even stand <laughs> to, to not be him to, yeah I, I, I couldn't even stand to watch it and, and I and to think what, what he was feeling and so I I asked him if I could dab it away and he indicated you know like that yes and and with his eyebrows going up and so I went and I, I did that and um, 
And then I, I, I went uh, to, to take another dab, and I could see he could see I could see as I was doing it that he he detected some danger there, and I, I went too hard, and uh, I hit his head, and, and and you know he had no control over his head, so so he he was set, set up in a certain way where he's stable, and then bam, you know it it falls flops over like a like a rag doll, and and, um, and I can feel feel that pain too, and so I you know I'm, I'm taking him and trying to put his head back, and now I'm like. <laughs> you know, I'm, what am I doing? You know, I'm, I'm damaging Stephen Hawking, and, and I'm trying to put his head up. And his glasses slide, and his sensor could determine when his glasses were too far, and then an alarm went off there because he's, they got to stay within a certain distance for him to talk. And so this beeping starts going, and I got his head and his sweat, and I'm like holding it, and, and then people start running in, going, "What's going on?" I'm going, "Oh, it was, it was, um, it was a bit." I broke him. I broke him. I broke Stephen Hawking. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> and um, but you know uh, again I, I learned first of all I learned the most important thing so I felt sorry for him in the beginning a lot for things like that because he couldn't wipe his sweat he had to depend on someone seeing it or he had to spend a couple minutes like saying something to someone to do that you know composing his his uh, pecking away composing his uh, message but I actually uh, at the end, or even not at the end, but after I got to know him better, I didn't really feel sorry for him anymore that way because um, I learned that he he just overcome that. I mean, he might have said yes, wiped it away, but but he actually learned not just that it wasn't just that he it wasn't that he needed someone to wipe it away. He learned not to mind. He learned he be, was to overcome. Not only did he overcome his bodily limitations, but he over, overcame his spiritual limitations that. That as human beings, certain things bother us unless we can exercise our mind over 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 the situation, unless we can take control of how we feel and 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 really take control of our brain. And, and he was really able to do that. He he could he had these many things in his life that for most people would be torture. Uh, the the sweat. Um, if you have an itch, you can't scratch it at, at, at night. He would lay in bed and he couldn't turn, so you get an ache or something, and everyone just naturally turns, or you turn even while you're asleep to keep keep that from happening. And he couldn't do that. I mean, he had carers who periodically would turn him, but it wasn't on demand when he needed it. In fact, and he couldn't even ask for it because when he's laying in bed, he wasn't hooked up to his computer. And so he had all these, you know, eating and having. He would chew a little bit, but stuff would dribble down his face. I went, went to fancy restaurants with him, and everyone. It, it, it's a very um, elegant place and he's sitting there like you're feeding a baby with with this you know stuff dribbling down his face and he wasn't embarrassed he didn't mind he accepted everything and he really learned to to have his his mind triumph over all the all the little insults of uh, the day that, that that the day threw at him every day so that that was a it was a big thing I, I strive for that in my life and it was inspirational I, I mean I wrote the book because I found Stephen to be very inspirational it really taught me uh, not just that I learned about how he dealt with life but it ta taught me gave me lessons for how I can deal with life and I sometimes think about you know I'm 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 feeling bad about X Y or Z and I think Jesus he Stephen had to deal with that every day and 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 he learned to do that and I can too and it actually ties back to my parents you know going through the Holocaust because I it's that lesson I think I, I it, it was um, I think I, th that's a lesson that that's been a theme in my life, and Stephen really amplified that for me, being that close with him. Yeah, and you said that he he he, he dealt with each day with humor and positivity, and he was he had found it was like a person who had found his place in the world, and you know, and after early challenges, and and we have to say that as well. But one thing you made me think of there is, it's like, and I think about this a lot with neurodiversity in the world, and that when we harness neurodiversity there's so many Stephen Hawking's out there but the world needs to change how it views people and unleash their creativity because just because you don't have certain uh, certain abilities doesn't mean that you're disabled you have an enhancement of other abilities and I truly believe that was you know it's like uh, uh, I'm doing this because I'm thinking of the whole idea of the waterbed effect where you know you don't you have these these disabilities here, but you have these super abilities here. 
but the world has not harnessed those abilities in the past. And I think that he's done so much for the universe, so much for the world and humanity to make us see that. And, and hopefully that transpires or, or transcends into organizations that so we can harness more great people out there. Right. And he did, he, you know, as I said, his communicate, he had a super ability, super power of communication. Uh, in physics also, he, he developed certain compensations and, and superpowers that, that, that other people don't have and that he never would have developed if not for his uh, physical disability. He, he developed a, a, a certain peculiar, I don't mean it in a bad way, I just mean unusual uh, geometric way of thinking that other physicists don't use. I mean, in, ge in, in physics, we do, we use equations and we also use pictures or geometry. Uh, but the, but the bulk of physics, even though the geometry is everywhere and very important, is, is done more what we would say call analytically, uh, with uh, using differential equations and this other these kinds of uh, other kind of math that's not purely geometrical. And <clears throat> and Stephen had as Skip Thorne, his good friend, Nobel Prize winner, told me he had a superpower uh, of, of geometric thinking because he he developed. A, because he couldn't write equations on the blackboard or the paper like what the rest of us do, and he had an amazing um, uh, kind of photographic mind where he could remember or keep a lot in his head, but it wasn't infinite. So he had to find some compens compensatory way of doing it. And he developed these, this, in, this unique, unusual geometric uh, ways of, of, of analyzing problems. And that really allowed him to, to do it without using the blackboard, but it also, uh, gave him uh, insights that other people didn't have because he was looking at things inherently from a different way than other people were, and that allowed him to make some of his advances to, uh, in a, to the way because he would he would look at things differently than other people, and that was all do, you know due to something he developed because of his disability. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the that's the thing. I, I'd love to broadcast that to the world and go, look, look what we can do with Asperger's and autism and dyslexia and dyspraxia, that it's 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 got these gifts that come with the challenges like everything has. And um, you remind me there, you mentioned you, you've, you've written and worked with Richard Feynman. He, he was the same. Do you remember he talked about when he was almost too advanced for his class and he was seen as some teachers would have seen him as misbehaving but one teacher said actually fine man you need to read this and gave him something to almost shut him up but it gave him a unique way of thinking and i think that 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 way of thinking is is so important and also to share that to people who have children out there who may appear to be misbehaving because it might not be misbehavior. I'm very sympathetic for all those parents who are like that. I, I was that kind of kid. I was constantly in trouble. Uh, I was totally bored in school and so I would talk, do things, or just or not do what I'm supposed to or actually I ditched school a lot, didn't show up. and. Um, uh, you know, I think I turned out fine, <laughs> and, and I think that school isn't <laughs> for <worked>. everybody. <laughs> well, and, and school, school, it, 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 that's another question. So we don't want. I won't go too far into it, but but <laughs> that's, that's another book. book man. Man. And it's different in every country, but 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 at least the school here is is not uh, uh, is not aimed at, and it's nothing to do with the teachers. It's it's just the system and and and, and the, the tests that they make them take and, and the curricula that they that they give them. But it's not it's not geared toward creativity, imagination, and, and problem solving. It's toward uh, memorization, regurgitation, um, and in a way, it, in a way, it tends to it, it, to kill uh, people's spirit, you know, intellectual spirit. Uh, if you if you're not if you're not careful, um, and so a lot of I think people who who are uh, innovative and imaginative have trouble in in school because it's just not doesn't suit them it doesn't it's not their approach um so so Feynman was one like that who was always a rebel and and I think was bored in school and but what's interesting that you mentioned him is he, he's another one who was known for his geometric thinking in physics so he was famous for that and, and one of his um big advances uh, which we call uh, path integrals uh is is really a geometric way of looking at interactions that normally were looked at with equations. And he has he literally has these things called Feynman diagrams that he um, invented for doing certain calculations that are pictures of things 
hitting each other and, and going away. And from the pictures, you can infer the, the physics. So uh, he, he was another anomaly in that sense that he was so extremely uh, geometric oriented. I was talking to you before the show saying that, uh, I, you know, if this forthcoming concept for the show, I'd love you and Deepak Chopra maybe to come on and discuss the idea of, of colliding disciplines. Because when, when you, there's a saying in innovation that in, innovation happens at the intersections. And it, I, I truly believe it's because of that. So D. Hawk, who's the founder of Visa, is a great friend of the show. He's been, he's now 93, amazing man, still writing his, a new book. He said that one of the most valuable things in his life was reading wide and uh, eclectically. And through that, you end up connecting dots. And like you say in education, not collecting dots. And that's the genius. And I'm, and you're that's the same, man. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's just how I explain it to my students is like, you, you need to learn how to collect them, not connect them or connect them, not collect them. But um, one of the things I thought about you is that even so every every experience you have is like new frames on on the on the lens of life. And your experience with Stephen gave you unique lenses that no one else in the world would have. Yeah. Uh, and and um and of course, he he, he had that, uh, you know, and I and I, I was able to a lot of that, would, you know, rubbed off on me, and and, and you know, and, and it, it, so it was a real gift to be able to work with him. So let's get back to the to the. And by the way, that was his strength, of course. Sorry, but it's c yeah. connecting the dots in ways that people didn't see, right? Yeah. And you, man, I, and I, I like, I, I really, I have, I keep pointing back here because I have uh, elastic back there, and I've, I've the rest of your books in my Kindle here in front of me, but um, I got it somewhere here too. There. What have you got there, man? I've got elastic. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the American. I don't know. I, I bet, I bet out there in. Um, hey, I, 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 I have a paperback, paperback man. man. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's, the, there's, there's the, the paperback. paperback. Oh, there we go. Right there. Got it. Yeah, same same color, but and and also everybody knows that the Max Planck uh, that Max Planck uh, uh, license plate number behind there as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's that, funny. So, so since I have such a difficult name, when I make reservations uh, in a restaurant or some place, I I, I I I got tired of people. They can't get the name Miladnov right. They can't spell it or say it. They even these days they have trouble with Leonard. Believe it or not. <laughs> so I'm thinking oh, I got to wow. simplify my. Yeah, I don't know. It's just ignorance of America today, I think. But but um, so I, I thought I had to simplify it. So I, I said, "What's a simple name?" I thought, "Of course, my hero Max Planck." You know, how can you? <laughs> okay, they might they might leave the C out in, the, in his last name, but that's okay. But if I call a restaurant, I say, "What?" Well, they say, "What's your name?" I say, "Max Planck." I never get what. How do you spell this? That they write they, they write something down, and and they never know who he was. By the way, unfortunately. Yeah. It's sad, isn't it? Yeah, it's sad, it's it's sad that that knowledge dies out, you know. And and I think he said it actually. He said uh, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> but but you don't want that happening, Max Planck himself. But uh, let, let let's let's jump back to Stephen because there's a I wanted to share I wanted to intertwine some of the theory with his life itself because some people don't know why he he was wheelchair bound and he was 21, 1963 and he was diagnosed with ALS and that's what happened and he knew it was coming and people said you're drinking too much Hawking stop drinking too much and then of course this disease gradually took hold of his body but the interesting thing is ALS usually gives a, a lifespan of two to five years after diagnosis and he absolutely beat the hell out of that and I truly believe it's because he had a, a higher purpose and something to contribute to humanity, and that's what drove him, including these friendships that he had uh, he had harnessed and, and and created with people like your good self. Well, I think that's a big a big part of it. He he was actually a goof off as an undergrad at Oxford, and he he was studying physics. He wasn't studying very hard. He was very talented. So I'm not saying that he wasn't doing well, but he just didn't wasn't applying himself. And when when he got the diagnosis, it, it really. Uh, it really, you know, some people, when something really tragic happens, they find God. And he, he, he found, he didn't find God in, in the usual sense, but he found purpose and meaning in his life. And what that was, was he decided that he really wanted to devote his last few years, and he thought it would just be a few years, to understanding where we came from, uh, with the meaning or our place in the universe. I think it made him think about life and, and death 
And, and so he decided to devote himself to that. And that's what he did devote his next decades to. He, you know, and he thought that it would just be a few years. But in physics, that meant he, he turned to things like the origin of the universe, to questions like that, to real fundamental questions uh, of, of the beginning. And at that time, no one was, not many people were looking at that. It was, uh, it was a real backwater, and, and for, for, for good reason, really, which is that uh, back in the early 60s, there was no way of, of observing, certainly not doing experiments or, or observing uh, the universe back then. It was just before the uh, so -called discovery of the so-called microwave, cosmic microwave background radiation, which I won't get into, but that opened up a, a whole new way of, of looking back in time at the early universe, but that wasn't that wasn't discovered till uh, '64, and it was many years till we got to be able learn to be able to really study it in great detail and, and learn a lot about uh, what what happened in the early universe. So people thinking science physicists thinking, well, that you know the, the way the universe began is kind of a moot point because we can't test our theories or our ideas. Uh, so people, you know, some people were looking at it because they were curious about what the equation said, what Einstein's equations uh, for gravity. Uh, would, would say about the, the origin and development of the universe, but because there was not this uh, observational access to it, uh, it wasn't a very hot field, and Stephen didn't care about that, because he, he's, first of all, he was a very stubborn guy, and, uh, and he, he wanted to know about the beginning, and, and he knew that, that these theories could tell us, and he wanted to understand what they said, and so uh, that, that's how he got started, and, and I think that having that drive, that meaning, and that purpose, I mean, I think that's for, for everyone, I, I think that's very important in your life. If, if all you do is go to work and make the donuts and, and then come home and, I don't know, drink beer, watch TV, and go to bed, uh, I think you're going to get depressed. I, I, I feel that, that, that life is, uh, people are much happier when they have whatever it is, a meaning or a purpose. It could be raising your kids. It could be uh, doing a hobby, bird watching, <laughs> painting, um, it, whatever it is, you need a reason to get up in the morning and a reason to want to, to, to get out and, 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 and to exist. And uh, psychologists have shown that people who have that are healthier and live longer. And, and I think that is even more amplified in Stephen's case because everything was so difficult for him to do that, that if he didn't have a reason to do it, something driving him, I think he would just let go and fade away. And to uh, tell you the truth, I always felt that some of his work, especially uh, not only in the 80s, but then again in the 2000s that we wrote about in the Grand Design, this, this new work that I, uh, recent work that I wanted to, to write about with him, I, I think that really answered the questions for him about where the universe came from and why the laws of nature or physics are what they are. And even though there's still much to be done in physics, I'm not saying we've solved physics, but I think he, he, found, his, I think he found his answers and I think that he was satisfied with that when he died and I think in a way, from, the, from what I've heard about his last months, his letting go really uh, came because he felt that, 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 that he had satisfied his, his life ambition. There's a line I pulled that I absolutely loved because it's, it's about finding those great moments in life, but also about, uh, about seeing how good we have it really, you know, and it, it's so important in these chaotic times that we have right now. You said... We all know we will die. For most of us, that is an abstract thought. But it wasn't for, for Stephen, and it's not for you. Stephen said it inspired him to value each of his remaining days. And so he milked the most out of life that he possibly could. And I thought that was inspiring in many ways. But it, it reminded me of the story of when you went rowing and you were relegated after the brow incident to uh, holding the pink handbag. <laughs> Yeah, well, we went one afternoon. We one of his carers asked me if I wanted to go rowing. We could see from Stephen's face that he wanted to join us. So I was a little bit surprised. But what um, what, we, what the activity it was was called punting down the cam, uh, which I suppose uh, people in England and Ireland uh, know know what that means. But for us in the states, uh, I, what is that? And and that that that's a flat boat that's somewhat unstable. It seems, and and I know that. I've heard of them being tipped over, people falling off, and to, to, it just seemed like a rather adventurous thing, uh, 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 um, something that perhaps he, he shouldn't be doing because, uh, because of the nature of it. Uh, but Stephen 
Stephen, uh, he did everything. He, there was nothing. He went on the Vomit Comet, which is a plane that, that flies, <laughs> a 747 that flies in parabolic paths. And on, so on the way down, you're weightless, and he's floating around. And you can imagine his doctors didn't want him to do that. Um, and no, no one knew what that would do to someone who couldn't move or had the disability that he had. But he just wanted to do everything. He wanted to go up into space. Richard Branson said that when he gets the space plane going, he will take him into space, and he was ready for that. So this was maybe, in his universe, a little thing, but to me it was a big thing. So we had to take him, pack him up, which took takes a while, take him, the van down, and then you can't drive right to the river, so you, you, you're up on the street, there's all these uneven stone steps, you gotta carry him down, and he's, you gotta take him out of his wheelchair, unhook him from his method of communication, take off his whatever, you know, his medical stuff isn't there, and you gotta kind of, these two women, like, you know, hundred hundred pound women, and there I am, more like almost two hundred, <laughs> one eighty, and I'm going. I can carry them. They're going. No, no, no. You're gonna, you're gonna hurt them. <laughs> and so one takes his legs, one takes his head, and, and then they have here carry my purse. And so I'm, they're, they're carrying him, and his head now is flopping around. So I'm realizing, mm, okay, I guess that happens. That, and they're carrying him down the steps, and um, I'm following them. And when we get in, they go and they position him so he's laying there, and he's. And, and, and one of them is, uh, one of his carers is cradling his, his head. And what happened is as he looks left and right, they'll turn his head so he can see what he's, what he's trying to look at. Uh, and, um, and so I, they're in the boat position. And now I got to climb in and I'm unsteady. I almost fall. And he starts laughing. Or, you know, he puts a big smile on his face because, you know, I'm the one who's having problems getting in there. And I'm, again, always thinking I'm going to tip it over and he's going to drown. <laughs> But it, it was, no, it was, it was fine, and, and um, they're feeding him champagne and strawberries. I guess that's the custom. As we're, as we're, <laughs> yeah, someone is, the way the boat works is someone stands on the end with a big pole, kind of like in Venice, and pushes, pushes you down against the bottom and pushes you along. And it was a wonderful time, and, and, and it just showed me that you know, don't think he's not going to do something because don't think he can't do something. You know, don't think he's not going to do something because of his disability, whatever, whatever is there, he, he's open to it. I'd love to, I'd love to come back to, you said he had a sense of knowing what was going on with the universe and maybe we'll finish on that. But I, I just wanted to share how I wanted to wrap back in meaning and purpose because we saw this actually with his wife because he was married. He married the same year he was diagnosed with ALS. He took a serendipitous step onto a train platform in St. Albans in London. And it was that moment that actually changed his life immeasurably as well. But that ultimately led to a divorce. And I thought it was interesting because what I read from between the lines was that uh, his wife loved him dearly. Absolutely. But she had no meaning in that relationship. And that actually was a huge challenge. I hope I've set that up okay. Yeah, well, I think, so So she had her own uh, c career that she was interested in in, in, ac in academia, um, uh, what was I think Spanish literature and, um, but, but, but being with Stephen, especially as the years went on, became more and more of a full-time job because he needed more and more help. And in the early days, he didn't have the money uh, to have the assistance that, that, that he would need. Moving around, being fed, bathed, going to the bathroom, and, and so she would, would have to do all that. And, and then as his, uh, his, of course, his work consumed him, and then his fame when he, got, when he wrote A Brief History of Time, uh, it became... A situation where everything was about Stephen, I think, and I, I think that she lost herself in the end, and that's why she. Uh, I think that's why they drifted apart because, um, you know, just 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 being married some to someone, just being married to someone who's that intensely focused on the work is is a challenge. Being married to someone who's very famous and is always going around the world is a challenge. Being married to someone who is disabled and needs a lot of help is a challenge. So she had the like trifecta of challenges there. And I think it just uh, eventually uh, wore down the marriage. I, I wanted to just share that, you know, people didn't just see the, the celebrity uh, physicist, Stephen Hawking, that there was, a, there was so much humanity and so much experience behind getting there. Like it wasn't an overnight success by any means, but also the quality of stubbornness. 
I, I think it was George Bernard Shaw said all all progress uh, depends on the unreasonable man. So you need to actually challenge things. You need to be willing to put yourself out there. This show, Leonard, a lot of change makers, entrepreneurs, people working in large organizations who want to change those organizations work there. But one of the biggest challenges is conformity because nobody likes being told they're wrong. But it's very much part of your world because you build upon other people's work, but you also challenge the heck out of it. And I'd love your thoughts on that idea of being the challenger because you are one, Max Planck was one, Stephen was certainly one. Well, you see, there's, that's what I wrote the, the, the book Elastic about, that there's two, 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 two ends of human thinking, two types of thinking. One is logical analytical thinking. That's good for a situation that you're familiar with, that you've encountered before, where you know, you know, you know the framework, you know what concepts that to use to analyze the problem. Uh, you, there's some, certain assumptions that you're going to make uh, that before you attack the problem, you know what your goals are, and you're just applying the rules of logic from A to B to C to go to your conclusion. And that is, that, that, that is what people think of as science and math is like that. You're very analytical, logical. It's not really. I mean, it's partially that, but that's not all of it. I mean, that's not maybe, I would argue, not the most important part, but that's the part that people think of. When you, when you apply for a job, most, most uh, companies are, are looking for that, and it's what universities test for in, um, in their tests, right, in their admissions tests. But the other end of human, uh, the other end of thinking is what I call elastic thinking, and that's the kind of thinking that you need when you encounter a new situation or a change situation. So when you encounter something you haven't seen before, you have to create in your mind, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, you have to create a framework of how you're understanding the situation. What are the concepts you're going to use? What assumptions are you going to make? Uh, what are the rules of, uh, of logic you should use? Or what are your goals even, right? And so that's elastic thinking. And, and that's the kind of thinking that people traditionally could understand that artists and writers perhaps need, but they didn't see that the great usefulness elsewhere. But as times are changing so rapidly now, our lives are changing, we're constantly being challenged with learning new apps on the computer um, or, or facing uh, changing uh, work situations, COVID, globalization, the new the political turmoil. Everything is constantly providing us with, with challenges or situations that, that we have to understand new. Um, or if you're an innovator, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to keep ahead because everything is, is being, technology is advancing so quickly now and you want to innovate, then you have to be able to, to question the way that you're seeing things. You have to be able to say, how, what are my assumptions? What assumptions am I making? Um, uh, you know, what are, how, what's my framework of thought? How could it be different? And that way you'll come up with new ideas. Einstein, for example, special relativity. Special relativity, any high school kid could do. The, the, the mathematics is just high school algebra. So, so you could take any high school kid today and you could, you could tell them what the problem is and they could do the algebra to find special relativity. So why did, was Einstein the genius and the other physicists looking around in, those, in that time didn't find that? They were trying to solve a certain problem with the speed of light and they, and they, were, trying to, they were experts and they were trying to solve it using their expertise in known physics. And Einstein had a different frame of mind. He had a different mindset. He, he, he was a young guy. He wasn't even a, a, in, in acad academia, right? And he was like a rebel. And he's going, well, forget about what, what I know, what I think I know. Let me look at what it takes to figure this out. And let me work backwards to see how I should change what we thought we knew, you know, in order to conform with that. That's a different mindset. So Stephen's mindset was always like that. It was always questioning, looking for the new thing, not accepting what other people said. And, 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 and looking at it himself in his own new ways, trying to understand what are the assumptions that I'm making that I don't realize I'm making, and then I can question them once I know what they are and what other assumptions could I make. And so he was a groundbreaking physicist in that way, and, and that's really Max Planck, I mean, the same thing. That's what's, you know, every physicist, theoretical physicist, has to be really good at logical, analytical reasoning. But what makes you a great physicist and the kind that is remembered is the elastic thinking, the, the, the thinking outside of the box, the, the thinking where you're looking at something in a new way or you're, 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 you're creating new concepts and a new approach. And, and that's what's really valuable in, in innovation and pushing society ahead. 
man, I wanted to talk to you about Elastic. <laughs> we'll do it again. We'll, we'll have to do it again. <laughs> and it's very related it's, it's, to Stephen, but... Yeah. No, no, we, we, let's let's honor the man. Uh, but you reminded me of a quote by Einstein. We can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And that's what he's talking about, that that your frameworks, your mental models update, and then so do so do the models have to update. And that's why I think the, the value of, of neurodiversity is so valuable because if somebody sees the same problem differently, they'll they'll have a chance of solving it th then differently. Like if you're stuck, the m mental models need to be unlearned and relearned, etc. And I think, you know, that's what I really got out of Elastic as well is that that way of thinking that that, you know, we need to unlearn and relearn and uh, and keep doing so more than ever before. And I think one of the big challenges, Leonard, as you know, is when we get into organizations, when we get into positions in life, we tend to batten down the hatches and defend what we've achieved rather than being open to for challenge and, and for new information. Yeah, it's a very much so. It's a very um, it's a very uh, uh, debilitating uh, effect. Uh, that that's one reason why often people who in, in science, for example, get very successful then stop stop churning out great work because they 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 get into a certain mindset and which is even more uh, uh, even harder to become free of when you're the one who invented the the the, 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 the framework. And so you can't move on and see things in a different way. Whereas the new kids, like Max Planck said, funeral, science advances funeral after funeral because you, you have great ideas, you get stuck in a certain mindset and you move on, you can't move, you die. New people come in, they are not stuck, like Hawking when he was younger and, and decided to go into this, ask these questions like Einstein, and then they make their advances and then they often get stuck. That is, there's crazy stories. Uh, when, when uh, Stephen Hawking first got to Cambridge, for example, there was uh, Fred Hoyle, a very talented, famous physicist who made a lot of great advances, but he was stuck because he, he believed in something called the steady state theory. The evidence was that it was totally wrong and, and, and it's time to move on to the new, back then, new Big Bang theory. <laughs> and, but, and, and, and Stephen actually wanted to work for Hoyle. He didn't realize all this at the time when he was coming in, but Hoyle was the big shot. And Hoyle had too many students, so luckily Stephen didn't work for him and worked for somebody else. But Hoyle was stuck in that thinking, and his whole career crashed because he couldn't let go of that of that successful, but wrong, seemingly successful, but wrong idea that had been superseded of the steady state theory. And so he, the people keep looking, keep looking for ways to fix it, ways to save it, ways to modify it, to keep it, rather than going, let's just let go of that and, and do something new. And that's that's a you know I, I talk about in. Yeah, I think it was in Al it was in Elastic. I talked about uh, a, a study uh, at a cardiac ward uh, in a hospital where they found that that the, that the patients uh, have a lower mortality rate when the when the expert the most senior doctors are away at conferences, <laughs> and, and they realize that what happens is look someone comes in with a with a standard thing and the the junior people know how to treat it the senior people know how to treat it no problem they're fine somebody comes in with a non standard problem that's that's a bit odd. What happens is this, the, the experts tend to put the square peg in a round hole and, and you know, view it. Don't, they don't notice the novelty or that they need a new approach and they just treat them the conventional way and they die. And the new people see, see you know, they're, they're, they're freer to, to see that it's different and to react to it. And it's interesting. There have been other studies along those lines that show the same thing. A, a study of chess experts, for example, that a lot of times the chess the experts looking at certain problems are blind to seeing things because they know too much. And people who are more novices uh, find the solutions to these problems so quicker because the solutions are require a certain unconventional thinking and, and they're free of the conventional thinking and the experts aren't. So uh, that, that's a big, um, a big barrier to, 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 uh, to progress that's a human trait it's not they're not broken it's not it sometimes it's hubris but not all not always sometimes you just get stuck in your thinking and you you need to be elastic with your thinking and, and be more open to it what ways do you suggest for like a lot of business people a lot of ceos listen to this show leonard's for them in a business context because i know you were on a phenomenal tour before lockdown around the world on elastic so you would have went and spoke to a lot of senior organizations there's a lot of things. Or there's things you can do in a corporation. For example, um, 
there's there's a top-down approach to management and then there's a bottom-up approach, just like your brain has a top-down and bottom-up thinking. So top-down means CEO or senior executives just make all the decisions of what, you know, of what to do and people below that execute. Or in your brain, there's structures that govern uh, where your attention goes and where your focus goes and how you, you know, how, how, how the rest of your brain should process information. Uh, so that's the top down. And b- bottom up is, is uh, when in an organization you have the, the, the people who are on the ground doing things feel free to, to innovate and to suggest changes in the, and, the, and the upper levels are, are willing to look at that. Um, and in, in, for instance, in biology, a good example of bottom up is ants. So each ant is a, is a very simple creature that doesn't have the big picture and doesn't, doesn't really know, um, there's no, there's no, you know, doesn't really know the big picture of where the ants are going or what they're trying to do, but they have their own little job to do. And there's no boss at all telling the little ants what to do. The queen, of course, is not really a boss. The queen is just uh, there for reproduction. And, and, um, and yet, when these ants are on a leaf and there's another leaf nearby, they'll form a human or an ant bridge from, from one leaf to the other. And it's all the little ones uh, having their little reactions to their own particular situation that, and on the whole, creates something that's much greater than the sum of its parts. It's almost as if there's an architect or an engineer, but it isn't. It's all the little things building up, so that's bottom up. So an organ, you know, and your brain has neurons. All your ideas come from bottom up. All your your brain has dumb neurons that are just, uh, you know, uh, components that take in input, and when it reaches a threshold, put out out you know fire, and they have no idea what you're trying to do or who you are. But the hundred billion of them that you have working together creates you, right? So in organizations, you you want both, you know, but but some organizations are much too top down. You want to have allow bottom up. Uh, so you want to make it free and encourage, you know, the ideas of people getting together, trading ideas, and you have to listen to them. Um, at a personal level, you have to um, you have to also listen to your brain. You have to um, don't be afraid of being wrong. It's very important to 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 be okay with being wrong. As a theoretical physicist, I know. I know that I'm wrong most of the time. Most theoretical, most of your ideas, if you're a theoretical physicist, by far are, are wrong. You try this, you try that, nothing works. Uh, you just keep plugging away till you get something that's that's good, right? But people in general get defensive, uh, embarrassed. Uh, they 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 don't like to make mistakes. They 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 don't want anyone to know. They want to hide that. They want to argue that it's not really a mistake. You got to let go of that. Uh, that's very important because. Your, your brain on the unconscious level has many, many ideas, crazy ideas, brilliant ideas, uh, silly ideas, conventional ideas. And he has so many ideas, whatever you're trying to do, that, that, that it doesn't present, your brain does not present them all to you. There are filters that, that keep them in your unconscious mind and don't let them come to your consciousness. It, 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 these filters say, oh, um, this, this and that has worked in the past. Let's present those ideas. Uh, it, 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 your brain is making predictions about what will work and, and it's presenting you the most promising ideas which are the most conventional. If you ever want those other weird ideas to pop up, you need to learn to relax those filters and being afraid of being wrong tightens the filters and makes the, only the most conventional come. If you want innovative ideas, you have to learn to open up. That's what you know, Elastic was about, ideas like that. So there's things that you can, things that you can do and things you can do in your organization. You know, and don't punish people for having a wrong idea. I mean, you might, I'm not saying people who are incompetent, you should, you should reward them, but this is not incompetent. Some ideas just don't work, but they could still be a good idea. You want to reward ideas. You want to have people not be afraid of being wrong, not be afraid of failing. And the same for you. Man, we have to do a show on Elastic. <laughs> we were talking before we came on air about uh, stuff like AI and aliens and lots of stuff that was uh, that was in Stephen's kind of uh, consciousness. And um, I thought we talk a lot about it on the show about AI, but about the alien stuff, because there, a lot of stuff has been blown out of proportion. You were his friend. You had great conversations because I mentioned about your friendship and you mentioned about the restaurant. Stephen used to love to connect over having a meal together. That was his way of really connecting. And I'm sure you had lots of conversations about aliens. I'd, I'd love if you'd share something there as a kind of a final story before we wrap up. Well, it's interesting because we have no evidence uh, that that there are aliens, and Stephen was very much being a scientist, very much evidence based. But he 
he did think that there were aliens, uh, not that there's aliens flying around here or that, that, that when your neighbor who says that they, that they were abducted is, is, is not delusional, but, but he believes that in the universe that there are aliens because his, his whole life was devoted to understanding our place in the universe. And one thing that he realized is that we're a natural phenomena. We're not special in the sense of being the, the only life forms here, that we're just a natural phenomenon, just like algae or uh, the, the clouds on, uh, on Venus. And so, of course, he, he would think about, well, if there are aliens, what's, how does that affect us and what's going to happen? And he felt that the chances of aliens finding us are very, very slim of our having, you know, contact with flyby aliens, as you see in science fiction movies. And I think one way to, to see why that would be is that the universe is very sparse. There are the, there are a lot of lot of stars in the observable universe, a um, hundred billion stars in our galaxy, but but they're very far apart. If you take a, a bullet or a projectile and you just fire it out, uh, the chances uh, over the next uh, billion years that you'll hit anything are extremely pretty practically zero. Everything is just so spread out and it takes, of course, time to get from place to place because there's a limit in, in time, but because of the speed of light. However, Stephen didn't stop Stephen from speculating about how would they, how would they be if they did, uh, if they did get here. And it wasn't a very happy picture he found. Uh, he, he thought that, that the aliens, that, that if aliens came here, they more likely, uh, be what we would consider the uh, well evil, destructive type than 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 the kind that's going to come and uh, come in peace and say, you know, uh, let's all trade technology uh, <laughs> theories. <laughs> and I think that's because look, any civilization that is so far advanced, they can travel from start one star to another, uh, and we know the challenges there. We we can't even yet send people to Mars in our own solar system. So you can imagine being able to go to stars that are light years away. Um, anyone, any civilization that's that advanced uh, would, would 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 not look at us as equal. So if, if we let's say we go to Mars and we find oh look there's little squirrels on Mars and there's cows and uh, wow we didn't we didn't realize that from the rover they didn't find that but actually there's quite a nice kinds of wildlife here on Mars. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to use the horses as beasts of burden, uh, maybe as our pets to, we're going to ride them around. We're going to eat the, eat the cattle or the pigs or whatever we do, right? We're going to treat them like animals. And that's how I think aliens coming here would treat us. They, we might think that we're, you know, leaps and bounds above, uh, above uh, pigs and, and cows and fish that we eat. But I think the, the aliens might not think that. <laughs> And so that's a scary thought because it's not that they're evil at all, but it's just that in the natural scheme of things, they may, you know, they may see us as food uh, or pets, put us in cages. And when you think about that, though, you realize that be kind to animals because that, to me, that's what that says. And, and maybe be a vegetarian. So, and maybe if we're lucky, the aliens will be. Yeah, and that's a fantastic way of thinking again. And you know, there's so much empathy in your writing in this book. And uh, it's been a fascinating talk with you and a great read. And I really look forward to having you back on the show again. There's so much. Guys, if you're if you're going to buy a book, Leonard's books are fantastic. Elastic is brilliant. Subliminal is brilliant. Feynman's Rainbow. Absolutely, really enjoyable reads. I thought a great way to finish would be you talked about your final moment, and Steve, Stephen was uh, didn't believe in an afterlife. But when you were in the church and looking at the program with a smiling face of Stephen on it, you really felt, as you lay there in the coffin, that he was still with you in some way. And I thought that was a beautiful memory and a beautiful way to finish from my perspective. But I'd like to give you the final word and what you'd like to say, I suppose, about your your great friend. Well, it's funny because uh, I always thought, despite the fact that Stephen each year would have multiple episodes where he was his life was in danger, I always thought that he would uh, out outlive me, and um, and so it was hard hard to even accept when when I you know heard the news that he that he hadn't, and uh, I was on the aisle uh, in the church when they were carrying his coffin past, and, and so there he was in the box, and even though there was a, a box there, I knew he was in it, and I felt like. I just felt like he was there and still with us. It was, um, yeah, it was in a very uh, 
moving, moving feeling. And uh, I think that even though uh, I agree, I, I feel as he did that, that don't believe in the afterlife uh, or, or the kind of God that, that, that um, plays a role in human, uh, in human life. Uh, I, I, you know, I do feel that he's, his spirit is still, still here, still with all of us who knew him and were affected by him. Uh, just as my mother's is still with me. So I think in that way, uh, we all live on. And he has, you know, by affecting so many people, he's lived on in a very big way. A brilliant quote by Stephen that I, I thought was so apt and so interconnecting with Elastic is that he, he said this absolutely prophetic and and brilliant quote, which is intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, which is what we all need to do in this world of, of ultimate change. It, it will never stop changing. It will change faster and faster. Leonard, for people who want to find you, where can they find out about your books, your blogs, your talks, etc.? Well, you can, you can Google me if you get my name spelled, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, you can always get my name by just, you know, going to going to Amazon or somewhere and seeing who's the co-author with Stephen, you'll find me. But I'm on Twitter and um, my handle is at L Melodinov, at L-M-L-O-D-I-N-O-W, and the same for Instagram. Uh, and the books are, as I say, you can find them wherever books are sold at your local store or on, online or, uh, and uh, yeah. I, I've had a pleasure writing them. I would hope you have a pleasure reading them. It's been a pleasure for me reading and an absolute pleasure speaking to you and and uh, honoring your great friend Stephen Hawking, author of Stephen Hawking, a memoir of friendship and physics. Leonard Mladenov, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Did I say it right there? Yeah, you did. Yeah, so that was yeah, good. All right. yeah.